Threatened and Endangered Species Program Lead for the Bureau of Land Management in Alaska, and along with uh, the folks at ACCS, kind of helped uh, start the Alaska Bee Atlas. So Justin, uh, go ahead. Hello, I'm Justin Fulkerson, lead botanist at the Alaska Center for Conservation Science. And as Casey said, this has been a really big collaborative project between uh, Bureau of Land Management, UAA, uh, Fairbanks, UAM, Derek Sykes, and ADF and G, and also the Fish and Wildlife Service. So we're excited to uh, continue the Bee Atlas and uh, share how to do uh, the protocol with you today. All right, go ahead to the next slide, Justin. So this is our fourth year of the Alaska Bee Atlas, and it's just really exciting to see this continue to grow and the interest from you all and your organizations continue to grow and the body of knowledge that we have on bees continue to grow a lot thanks to the Bee Atlas work that we're doing. So if you all have questions as we're going through this, um, unless it's really timely or urgent, uh, just go ahead and put it in the chat or save it to the Q&A portion at the end. There's no restriction on unmuting and, and talking if you'd like, but um, uh, so there's a number of different ways you can ask questions if you'd like, and I'll try to answer when Justin's talking and Justin will try to answer while I'm talking in the chat if anything comes up and otherwise we'll, we'll get to them all at the end. Quick outline of what we're going to do is I'll kick things off today with some background and then Justin's going to get to the real main event here. Uh, survey planning, data sheets, sampling techniques and submitting your data and then I'll wrap it up again at the end. So go ahead to the next slide. So just some foundation here on pollinators and NBs for Alaska. I know pollinators are real critical for ecosystem function. In my mind, they're probably the most important uh, group of wildlife out there for ecosystem function. I think finally beginning to get the recognition and appreciation that they deserve for the role they play. Um, obviously, their uh, role, one of their roles in the ecosystem that's key is the actual pollination of our plants that creates that next generation and um, obviously makes the habitat for a variety of other wildlife species and really provides for that ecological function in the system um, that, that we need to keep everything going. They also serve as an important food source for a variety of wildlife. I think 90 percent of Birds are at least partially insectivorous at some point in their life cycle. And when you think of pollinators as including flies, uh, that's a real uh, important food source for a number of migratory birds, which come from all over the world to Alaska to nest and eat our pollinators and, and other uh, bugs. Um, also uh, important food source for a variety of other wildlife as well. And then just really between those things are just real critical for the ecological web of life and keeping our systems up and running in Alaska. Tying it to values for humans, um, the subsistence resources and their ability to, uh, their necessity really to pollinate berries and uh, create, um, you know, uh, berries for you know, subsistence harvest and uh, that traditional use is uh, critical, as well as again, just kind of providing that foundation and function for the ecosystem that provides uh, food for a lot of our big game species and other subsistence harvested wildlife. Uh, and of course, the farm and garden pollination benefits are, are important as well. Uh, not as maybe prominent in Alaska as they are in a lot of the other states, you know, like California, you know, there's a lot of wild bees and other pollinators providing that pollination service on, on cropland and in gardens. Um, so we do have that here, but it's just not as prominent due to our kind of lesser uh, stature in, in crop acres in other states, but still important and valuable for us here in Alaska. The problem, the challenge is, is that we have many data gaps and we, we still do, but especially when we started this Alaska Bee Atlas, which I, I believe this uh, map on the right is kind of the, the historic survey effort 
around when we started the Alaska Bee Atlas. And you can see there's huge gaps, especially in uh, western and northern Alaska or in like the upper Yukon River watershed. Um, kind of the southeast has some pockets as well where you could drop some points on there and draw a 100 mile radius around it. And we have zero uh, pollinator data or bee data from any of those areas. So we're starting to fill in those gaps and Justin will show you uh, a little bit more on that, I believe, in, in his section. but. The challenge that we have as agencies is that a lot of these areas are uh, land that we manage. I know there's a lot of people from Fish and Wildlife Service, Forest Service, BLM, Park Service here, and uh, it's really hard to manage these resources when we don't know what we have or, or, or where they are. So these data gaps, you know, we have data gaps not only with the distribution of the species, but with their status and trends. Uh, with their habitat associations and with their floral associations. So that makes it really difficult to assess their conservation status and to do anything to uh, reduce any sort of negative impacts to pollinators or even to do potential positive proactive work for pollinators. So go ahead to the next slide, Justin. So the solution, what's going to fix it all for us, uh, only half joking. The Alaska Bee Atlas is part of the solution here. We developed the Alaska Bee Atlas to help fill in these gaps across Alaska. And the way we built the Bee Atlas, as many of you know, is that we do this with uh, more opportunistic sampling. So, you know, we don't have the funds to often pay people to travel out to just do bee surveys out in the remote, remote parts of the state. But as we all go out and do whatever else we're doing in the field, you know, bird surveys, plant surveys, fish surveys, you know, archaeological surveys, walrus surveys, all of these things, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're out there and you're willing to be do bee sampling for us, you know, in some of these remote places that are high priority, we'll take it. So we provide the uh, training like we're doing today, uh, supplies for your field work. And then, um, you know, it's up to you, obviously, to go out and implement and bring your specimens back with your data sheet and get those back to Justin. But then on the back end, ACCS and, and other partners are working on the identification and the databasing and then really the, uh, you know, the sharing back of all of this so we can utilize the data. So um, that's really um, you know what the bee atlas is built on and it's been you know pretty successful for us in alaska and it's been a, a good model we are doing some targeted sampling this summer which i'll get to in a minute um, but for the most part we are doing this opportunistic sampling thanks to you all uh, and this does fit into national and international monitoring efforts and i'll get to that on the next slide we do have a small uh, community science program as well. We'd like to grow this. We just don't have the kind of administrative capacity to build it. But when we get interested, dedicated uh, community science participants that are going out to high priority places, you know, they're just as welcome to, to do this work as anyone else. Um, we don't open it up broadly because I think there's a lot of interest in the more developed areas where we have a lot of uh, historical survey information. So we really try to target uh, certain people in certain places at this point with community science, but it is something we'd like to grow. There's a lot of opportunity to engage the public and uh, educate about pollinators and get valuable data from them. Next slide, please. So when I talk about the different scales and piecing this all together, um, you know, there's a lot going on in the pollinator monitoring world right now. And these are just the efforts that I've been involved in. Um, and for better or for worse, there's not a whole lot of us that do this. You see a lot of the same people at all of these different groups and meetings, which is good in the way that it makes it easy for us to kind of align all of these efforts. So if we're out there collecting specimens under the banner of Alaska Bee Atlas, we can fit into all of these other efforts. Uh, DOI wide uh, coordination, the RCN, which is the uh, US wide native bee monitoring uh, coordination effort. Uh, we have a BLM national monitoring plan that we're putting together. We're doing Arctic wide monitoring. We're doing tri-national North American monitoring. So we're just trying to get all these cogs to uh, align and 
really the key, I think, in all this is kind of a centralized uh, accessible database, not just in Alaska, but kind of US wide or North American wide. And then ultimately visualization and access to that data, which will lead us to bee conservation. So all of the bee atlas data as it's processed, Justin has on the ACCS website, as well as the bee tool. If you haven't heard of the bee tool.com, check that out. That's now North American wide and put together by Fish and Wildlife Service. So if you want to check and see what's over the border in Canada, or if you're ever down in any of the other states, you can see what's going on uh, on the btool.com. Great uh, interface there as well. Next slide, please. So I think I've already covered a lot of this, but really the management implications of this is, is why we're doing this. That's what drew me in as the BLM uh, wildlife program lead is we, we needed information on our bees. Uh, and their habitats and their, you know, their status and trends, all this information so we could better manage them. So, you know, the management implications are as we get this data, we'll be able to use it for for management of habitat and ultimately hopefully conservation of these species. And really the other thing that I think is really important to emphasize is this is an efficient way to do it. You know, we're all rowing in the same direction here. We're using the same protocol. We're funneling in, into the same place for ID. It's being visualized on the ACCS website. So there's a lot of efficiencies in combining our, our efforts here. Next slide, please. Uh, so just quickly and kind of status for Alaska uh, for pollinators and bees specifically, the 2015 Wildlife Action Plan lists the entire order of Hymenoptera as a species of greatest conservation need based on economic and ecological importance. So we've got some uh, support and coverage from uh, the state there with the Wildlife Action Plan. Uh, Nature Serve, the, the GNS rankings, ACCS does those rankings for our pollinators in Alaska. Um, and you can see there's a numerous uh, S1, which is the highest conservation concern species, as well as S2 and S3 species, which are also considered imperiled and vulnerable. So some conservation concerns there as well. Next slide. And then our specific uh, interest at BLM is our BLM sensitive species list. And that's what really kind of helped me kind of get my feet in the door and all this pollinator work is when we did our we did our list in 2019, we came up with these uh, four BLM sensitive bee species now again based on their G or S rankings, as well as six watch list species. Oh, next slide, please. Um, so I talked a little bit about special efforts or special needs coming up this summer. Just briefly, there's a lot of interest right now in what's going on with the Western bumblebee. Um, it's under review for Endangered Species Act listing. Um, what was interesting is a twist here is that after it was uh, petitioned and under review for listing, it split into two species, the Bombus occidentalis and the Bombus mckayi. They were previously subspecies um, and now they're distinct species. So we have some areas down in southeastern Alaska where we're not sure if we have Occidentalis or not. So prior to this listing decision, we're definitely uh, emphasizing uh, the need for additional information to understand uh, if we do or potentially do not have this species. As far as we know, we don't have any confirmed records at this point of Occidentalis, but a lot of the areas that are potential habitat are, are under surveyed. So we'll be focusing on those areas this summer, Haynes and Skagway, uh, Hyder, and some of the upper uh, watersheds down through southeast, like the Stikine or the Taku. Next slide, please. So you all did a great job. I know a lot of people here are surveyed in 2022. Uh, here's some of the survey points. You know, there's a few others that are still popping in uh, for 2022, but we did a great job of hitting high priority habitats and high, actually highest priority is our, our highest level. Uh, priority areas for our survey work in 2022. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, and we had a ton of different organizations that have participated in the survey work in 20 in 2022. Um, you can see the different agencies and organizations there that have been involved, and that's one of our strengths again is the is the broad and diverse involvement of, of all of you across the state. 
Um, and next slide, please. All right, so Justin, you're going to have to key these one by one. So this is my first uh, foray into incorporating animation into my presentation. But since we don't really have a prize, I wanted to make it uh, as uh, fancy as possible for the surveyor of the year 2022. So what we did um, is we any survey that was in a highest priority area was worth five, uh, high four, medium three, low two, and lowest one. And we tallied up kind of who did the most survey work in 2022. So go ahead and give me a click, Justin. So coming in at number four, uh, Ryan Mung from Fish and Wildlife Service, who surveyed seven plots for a total of 23 points. I'll put an asterisk next to my name because my data did come in a little bit late, so I, I may be disqualified, but um, I did, with a lot of help and a lot of partners, I did 11 uh, last year uh, for 24 points, uh, and I worked with the Alaska Science Teachers Summer Camp. I worked with community science scientists, and I worked with some uh, BLM staff to do that, so it certainly was not me alone, but um, just uh, a lot of great field work last year I was lucky to do. Number two, Mark Bertram and George Galetta, Fish and Wildlife Service, um, six surveys for 24 points. Uh, thanks, Mark and George. And not number one, but 1 1.5. I didn't know how to split it out, but George Galetta had also surveyed with uh, someone besides Mark, so I tallied him up again separately. So George, if you're here, you're number two and number 1.5. And our surveyor of the year, fur, 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 Laurel Devaney, Fish and Wildlife Service, eight surveys for 32 points, a lot of highest priority uh, plots for Laurel. So thank you for uh, all that work. And then next one, uh, Justin, one more, some honorable mentions here from some folks that did uh, quite a few uh, other uh, surveys out in the field. Uh, Julia and Carly uh, uh, exemplifying our, our partnership approach with the Fish and Wildlife Service and, and NPS, respectively. Uh, Mary and Ramey from NPS, uh, Chris, and there's George again. Uh, that's his other, other points there. So thanks, Chris and George. And then Matt Bowser, Fish and Wildlife down on the Kenai. Thanks for your work as well. So those are our surveyors of the year. All right, Justin. That is the end of mine, so thank you, and I'll pass it to you. Hey, good job on the animation. I don't have access to the chat since I'm presenting, so if you could take a look at the chat, see if there are any questions real quick before okay. I move on. I will check into the chat. Um, oh, Chris says George was a student conservation association intern for Canudi and Yukon Flats. So um, with the recognized SCA, uh, in addition to Fish and Wildlife Service for, for George's work. So thanks for that, Chris. Uh, let's see, we've got another comment. Alexander says the QR code has been disabled when he tried scanning it. Um, so just a heads up there. And uh, that's it, Justin. So I'll keep an eye on the chat and you go ahead and proceed. Thanks. I uh, will check out the QR code later and update it. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. I'm going to quickly just talk about the survey planning. It's one of the really essential things about this project is a lot of coordination uh, with me and with your team that you're going out collecting with. Um, as Casey mentioned before, uh, there are over a overall goal of the bee atlas is to get high quality data with low amount of effort uh, these bee kits are really cheap uh, it doesn't take a whole lot of time commitment on your part but uh, expect to carve out about 30 minutes of field time uh, doing the sampling and we uh, strategize the bee atlas protocol so it's flexible to your field schedule uh, so that is to say that you can leave traps out uh, all day long or for 24 hours and come back and pick them up the next day uh, if you don't have that ability or luxury and you're moving uh, across Alaska pretty frequently, you could uh, just do a 20 minute uh, netting technique uh, to get something for us. So, um, 
So onto the planning, as I mentioned, coordination is really, really important. And what we want you to do is to commit and adopt the grid. And if you go to uh, the Alaska Bee Atlas website, we have our infamous uh, big uh, red highest priority grids across Alaska. And we just want you to uh, see where you're going to be going out already this summer to do your field work or other types of work. Um, and if you're going to a polygon that is a highest priority area or high priority area, uh, then it'd be awesome if you could collect some bees for us. Uh, we want you to review the protocol. It's been freshly updated and it's available on the Bee Atlas website and training uh, through this online training is optional but we're glad to have you and to answer any questions that you might have one of the most important things is i want you to register this allows me to coordinate the amount of work that needs to be done later on in the fall so i could allocate enough staff to do all the wonderful bee washing in our bee salon and also all of our pinning and coordinate identifications and then lastly uh, have enough funding set aside to do DNA barcoding for some of our more difficult bees to identify. So uh, registration ends today. Uh, so please register if you haven't. I got five extra registers today. So uh, I think people are waiting to the last minute. That's perfectly fine. So before going out to the field, we want you to absolutely verify where you're going in terms of the land management status. Most of you are working within your own regional offices or your managed lands, uh, such as Fish Wildlife Service or Park Service. However, you might have some specific uh, things that you need to do to do the work out there, such as permits. So please fill those out beforehand. I've worked with Park Service uh, before for uh, broad collecting in some of the parks. Um, so just please verify where you're collecting and if you need to get permission to uh, do collecting and sending us some supply, uh, sending us the samples. Uh, you'll be going out doing the sampling events and doing the data collection and then mailing the data specimens and photos to me in Anchorage. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll go through and bring up all of those bees that you collect to museum standards and we'll publish that data online. So we have uh, last year's data online right now at the alaskabeeatlas.org and I'm going to refresh it uh, later this week with some updated data so uh, you guys have some uh, more updated data of, of what was collected this last summer. Uh, and we've been sharing this uh, data not only online, but through email communications with uh, Excel spreadsheets of the hard and raw data. Uh, right now we're getting our database set up so it talks to the Fish and Wildlife Service databases uh, more efficiently. Uh, so there'll be a product to share with Fish and Wildlife Service later on uh, in the year or after the summer ends. And what's really uh, important with the data that we have collected, as Casey mentioned, is that this data directly goes into conservation assessments that we do at ACCS. And since we've collected a lot more uh, solitary bees, this last year is quite impressive. There is about 300 solitary bees. It's really brought in the range of where we're seeing solitary bees in Alaska, and it makes it uh, much more realized and more accurate uh, reflected conservation assessment. So we have been seeing things that are critically imperiled at S1, but they're dropping down to S3 or even an S4 just because uh, we're finding them more frequently than we had in the past. And then uh, we're also finding, still finding new species to the state. So uh, we keep adding new bees to the list. We have 111 bees in Alaska. And so all of that is really great, great data in knowing what bees we have in Alaska. So I mentioned uh, our sampling grid, and this is it here updated for 2023. So those grids that are colored red or orange or yellow, these are our priority areas where we really want to get more data from. So uh, please check out the website while you're doing the registration and adopt one of these grids that you're going to be going toward and uh, signing up that you're going to be sampling within that grid. Now, if you're collecting and visiting areas uh, that are grid cells that are clear. Those are our lowest priority areas. We already have quite a bit of bee data 
uh, from these areas, but it doesn't mean you can't do any collecting for the B Atlas program. It's perfectly fine if you do. Uh, we do have some suggestions for some habitats where are really fruitful for bees or where we we're missing a lot of data. Uh, one of those really big uh, habitats that we're missing a lot of data from are alpine tundra. So if you are within a lowest priority grid, if you could target alpine tundra, that'd be uh, really, really awesome and give us a lot more information uh, for higher elevation bees. And it's still OK if you are collecting in the lowest priority uh, areas too. As one example, Matt Bowser collected a new uh, record for the state it, that was in a lowest priority area, uh, but he was <coughs> collecting in uh, some one of these targeted habitats. So we can still find good juicy new bits of data in the lowest priority areas, but for overall we're just like really trying to get a broader scope across uh, the state so we get a better understanding of the distributions. Uh, Sheila raised her hand. Do you want to, do you have a question, Sheila? Yeah, I was just looking at your habitats. Um, how far post burn are you looking? Uh, nothing in particular. If it's probably within uh, five years, that's probably most ideal. Uh, that's uh -huh. when a lot of the vegetation is already coming back. OK. Okay, so there are three essential sampling types that you could choose your own adventure for collecting bees under the program. It's using bee bull traps that I'm holding in the top left hand uh, photo. You could use a blue vein trap that's in the bottom left hand photo Casey is uh, setting up, or you could do aerial netting, uh, which Casey is holding some nets in the bottom right hand area. So you could choose one of these or all of these or any mixture of these. It would uh, fulfill our heart and just make us really happy if you do all three, but we know uh, not everyone could do that. So just doing one of these is perfectly fine. Leave, the traps need to be left out for 24 hours to a couple of days. So if you can't do that commitment, uh, just doing the aerial netting would be perfectly uh, sufficient to collect some data for us. So choose uh, one of the sampling types that fits your skills and abilities and your time commitment. So I'm going to talk about uh, each of these individually. Now, we do need some materials and supplies to do this, uh, and all of the supplies that you need are listed on page nine of the B Atlas protocol. Uh, no matter which of the sampling types you're doing, you're going to need uh, 10 items, and these are in the white box in the top left. So uh, please review the protocol. Uh, they, we have descriptions of what uh, these uh, materials and supplies are, and we even have photos of what we're providing you um, near the end of the document on page 31. So everyone needs to have these first 10 things in the uh, white box. If And for each additional sampling type, you're going to need some additional supplies that we provide. Um, it depends on what you're going to be doing. So if you're doing the bee bowls, you're obviously going to need some bee bowls and some soapy water and a strainer. Um, and some water uh, out there with you. If you're doing the blue vein trap, you're going to need the blue vein trap that we provide. Uh, something that we don't provide is a stake or a pole to attach it to. I'll go over that in a little bit. Um, or a hammer. Maybe you can find a rock out there too. Um, and if you're not doing those traps and you're doing the net capture, you're going to need an insect net and a killing jar. Um, and a stopwatch. And this year we provided insect nets uh, to those who asked for it. Uh, so if you um, wanted to do the net capture and you didn't get a net yet, uh, please contact me and I could send you one. I still have a few nets left this year. So let's first talk about site location. Where are you going to go? You're already at your uh, field site. Where do you uh, set up your sampling? Well, there's some things that we want to keep in mind uh, for doing the sampling. And the first is seasonality. So May to early August, uh, most of Alaska falls under this. We don't want to sample really earlier in the year, uh, such as in April um, or really early May, because we have a lot of bubble 
bubble bee queens that are out and about foraging and making new homes and starting their colonies. If we start collecting these bumblebee queens, then the populations will essentially collapse. So we want to be mindful of that and sample a little bit later uh, in the year. So sampling later in, later in May to early August uh, works out really well. Now, if you're in Southeast Alaska, that uh, late May scenario probably be uh, bumped up a couple of weeks into earlier in May. So it just really depends on on where you are in Alaska. We want you to be out collecting bees uh, when it's warm and sunny weather. Uh, bees don't like rainy and windy wet weather conditions. They don't fly, they just hunker down. So uh, collect, if you're putting out bulls and traps in uh, severe storms and you're not collecting any bees, it's probably why. So uh, we prefer if you're collecting in warm sunny weathers or if it's slightly cloudy, that's fine too. The trap times, uh, we want the bee bowl set out for 24 hours. That's our preferred. However, if you can't leave it out for a full 24 hours, that's perfectly fine. Eight to 12 hours is okay. You're just gonna document that on your data form. We don't want the bowls out there uh, longer than 72 hours. The reason for that is that the bees start to degrade and get icky and gunky. Um, in the bowls before you collect them, and then we can't identify them. It's just uh, a bee soupy mess that nobody wants to deal with. So uh, please um, stick to that 24 hour time period. If you need to stretch it out a little bit more, that's perfectly fine. That's, it's not that big of a deal. The blue vein traps new this year, as I mentioned before, we want those out for five to seven days, uh, no longer than 10 days. The blue vein traps haven't been too successful the last two years. Um, but I think the thing is people are not leaving them out long enough. So if you're using a blue vein trap, we want you to commit and you stick them out there for five to seven days. And hopefully we'll see uh, improvement in the uh, collection efficacy of the blue vein traps because they work really well in the lower 48 and they've worked well in some particular projects in Alaska. So I, I think the key is to leaving them out a bit longer. <clears throat> Now, where you're going to be setting up the traps and uh, doing the netting of the bees, uh, we want you to stick to a homogenous site. So uh, if, you, if you're in a particular habitat, just uh, stick uh, to that. Don't cross over into uh, something else entirely different. And I have a lot of photos to show you some examples of what to do and what not to do. So I'll go over that in a little bit. Think about flower power. If you see lots of flowers in a nice, like beautiful flowery meadow, then it might be a great place for bees. So uh, feel free to stick the traps out there or do some netting um, in these areas. Some of the less favorable areas for sure uh, that we don't get a whole lot of bees or we get lower abundance and diversity of bees are forested habitats. The bees are there, they're just uh, not really um, as abundant. They're about 60% uh, less bees in, in the forested habitats and closed forests. So I generally um, like to tell people to steer away from those areas. You can still sample them, uh, but you're probably not gonna be, don't be disappointed if you're gonna be, um, or don't be surprised if you don't collect very many bees. That's probably why. Thick shrubs and big, tall, grassy areas, perfectly fine to collect bees, but you're gonna have to do a little bit of extra effort. And I got some photos to show you what to do. Um, mountaintops and ridge lines, any really windy habitats, windy tunnels, don't stick your bowls or traps out there. Pollinators don't like uh, really windy areas. Uh, they're just not gonna be able to hang out there and your bowls or traps might fly away. So we don't want that to happen. And lastly, keep it simple. If you could just leave your bowls around a camp area that you're uh, staying at for a week, um, that's pretty easy for you to set them out and collect them a day later. So uh, do what's best for you. Just keep some of these things in mind of a homogenous site, some flowers, and uh, really tailor this to uh, what you can do. Since um, this is really easy to do, we're not paying you, uh, but we're sharing data with you. Just do what you can to uh, within these guidelines and you'll collect really great data for us. So let's talk about the bee bowl placement. We want you to set out 15 bowls and the bowls are 
uh, three different colors, blue, yellow, and white. We provide a few extra bowls because accidents happen and they're plastic and they crack um, or they get lost and blown away. So we give you a few extra ones, but we want you to set them out in the alternating pattern. Um, so set out blue, yellow, and white as, as an example. What you'll do is you'll set the bowl out. You'll add some soapy water to a good squeeze of soapy water. So it's only about a quarter way full. They don't need to be all the way full. Just a little bit of, of soapy water is fine. You're going to take five big steps and place uh, down the next color bowl and then repeat in a straight line uh, of your area that you're sampling. You're going to record the trap time. Again, I mentioned 24 hours, uh, but it could be anywhere between 8 and 72 hours. Just don't go beyond that 72 hour mark. For the blue vein trap placement, the blue vein trap is into four separate parts, as you can see in the photo in the top left. You'll have to assemble this yourself, and we provide the zip ties that you see uh, in the photos to help you secure it to a stake um, properly. Uh, the black zip tie will be holding uh, up the blue vein trap and that will be attached directly to the stake. You want to have the trap approximately a meter in height up off of the ground. And then lastly, you're going to need to uh, use some string, which we don't provide, uh, to tie that up to the top of the stake, as you can see in that bottom left-hand photo there. And that'll keep the trap horizontal. That photo in the top right, you can see there are holes in the base of the trap. And uh, not all the traps have that, but we uh, have these holes there. And we also place the trap horizontally because uh, it limits the amount of water that will collect within the trap. And we don't want uh, uh, gunky bees in there for five to seven days. So we have it uh, propped up horizontally. Um, we have standard operating procedures in the protocol that goes over the exact details, step-by-step -step details of everything that I've covered here. So if you uh, miss something, uh, ask a question or please review the protocol. It's labeled out there pretty, pretty clearly. If you are using the blue vein trap in conjunction with the bee bowls, uh, just place the blue vein trap at the end of the transect. So you'll have your 15 bowls out and then a five meters out, then you'll have a, a blue vein trap. So I mentioned before some homogenous site locations. So here's a good example of some slightly varying uh, habitats within a, within a particular area. And our technician here is placing bee bowls along the contour of this line. And she's placing them within this uh, sagebrush a uh, really, really low shrub uh, flower habitat. So she's just placing it along the line, along the contour line, and it's uh, pretty close to within the middle of the habitat. And that's, that's great. What we don't want you to be doing is placing this across multiple different habitats and multiple different uh, vegetation types. So what's something to not do is to start into the forest and then go into the shrubby uh, flower area and then go back into the forest uh, because then we're sampling different types of habitats. And one of the main points of this project is to get tighter associations of habitats and flowers to the bees that we're collecting. So if you could do your best to pick a homogenous site that's large enough to hold the 15 bowls, uh, that'd be uh, uh, most consistent. Some people are out in the Arctic tundra and you're pre pretty much only going to be getting one habitat type. Uh, if it's like next to a stream or something, that that's perfectly fine too. Just keep it uh, within the stream area because those are going to have slightly different flowers than the real tussocky areas. Here's some other examples of how we've placed bowls in the past. And this is an example of an open forested site. So there's not a heavy dense stand of trees, but they're just kind of scattered out and about uh, with the shrubs. Those circles are where we have placed bowls. So just place it on the ground, take big uh, five steps and to 
get to the next um, area to place the next bowl on the ground. And we want the bowls visible. So you can see them here, they're pretty, they're pretty visible. As long as you could see the bowl, so can a bee. Here's some examples of a more densely forested area. Uh, and again, I just have uh, those circled where there are uh, bowls and we're trying to do our best to do it in a straight uh, line and a straight transect line through these habitats. Here's an example of some tall vegetation. This is slightly less favorable in some way, shape, or form for the traps. And that's just because you can see that photo on the right that it starts to cover and hinder the bowl. Um, so there, it's not quite as visible. Uh, so what we did uh, for this is to uh, clip away or break away or trample down some of the vegetation a little bit so those bowls are a little bit more visible. Um, an alternative you could do is you can uh, elevate these cups off the ground if you get pretty fancy uh, with some wire. Uh, I haven't seen anybody do that, and um, I could work with you if you really want to do that. Uh, it could be better just to do some netting only within these habitats if you're going to be doing the uh, sampling here. So uh, that's just something to consider. Make it a little bit easier on yourself. Here's another example of a shrubby vegetation with those pretty roses. Uh, Elisa Siegel is placing some bee bowls uh, into these grassy shrubby areas, and the bowls are visible uh, within uh, this shrubby habitat. So let's talk about the data collection form. So we set the traps out, and now let's uh, document what we did, basically. So uh, the data form has a couple of different sections. Uh, so we have a section on the site information of where you are setting things out, what the weather was at the time uh, of during the sampling time of, of that week or of that day or just those 20 minutes that you're out there, something about the habitat and the landform that you are doing the collecting in and uh, documenting some of the flowers that you see. Lastly, this uh, data form has a section where you could cut out labels uh, to place uh, into uh, the sampling cups, and I'll go over that in a little bit. So this first part for the sampling form, please uh, download and use the new sampling or the new data form survey form that is on the Alaska Bee Atlas website. And I know what your question is, how do I know I'm using the most uh, Recent one, it says right up there, Alaska Bee Atlas Survey Form 2023. So if it says 2022, don't use it. Uh, <clears throat> pretty straightforward. Uh, we want to want you to document the first day that you're placing the trap out there. Um, and really important that we want is to document what types of surveys you're doing out there. So circle those if you're doing the bowls, blue vein traps, or the net capture. Uh, this next section is the site information of where you're setting the traps out. So the site name, uh, we want it in this um, alphanumeric grid format. And uh, we want the first part of the site name to be the grid that you're collecting in. So it takes a little bit of, of uh, documenting what grid you're going to be traveling to beforehand. Write it in your notebook, um, and that'll be at the start of of your survey areas uh, or the site names, followed by your initial with the year. And um, obviously, this <laughs> I'm using this uh, from last year because I didn't update that as 2022 instead of 2023, but I think you get the gist. Um, and then lastly, uh, there will be a sequential letter. So if you're collecting uh, multiple times within the same grid. Uh, each time you do a new grid, or each do, each time you do a new sampling event, you'll add a sequential letter uh, after that. So this first one you do is A. Um, if you come back a couple of weeks later and sample the same area, uh, it'll be B. Or if you're sampling uh, within the same grid, but a different area, uh, use a new sequential letter. And what that does, it just gives a unique um, site code for that day and time and the people out there and just helps with the tracking process. 
you're going to collect the latitude and longitude. Um, if you can use decimal degrees, I can convert it if you don't, so it's not that big of a deal. Uh, we want the elevation. If you could grab that off your GPS unit, that'd be really helpful. And also circle what uh, units you're collecting in, meters or feet, how long you're leaving the traps out there. And then lastly, if you could give us a little snippet of locality description. So for example, if you're on a particular peak within the Alaska range, or if you're in the Anoka Wildlife Refuge on a particular river bend, um, capture that information there. That, that helps us with uh, when we're doing the identifications later on, uh, or knowing what region the bee has um, originated from. Moving on down to the data form, the weather, this is just averaged over the sampling time, so don't fret about it too much. It just more or less gives us an idea if you're out in a really great sunny weather and you need a sunblock, or if you uh, were out in a torrential rainstorm and then you caught no bees, um, then that be, might be more explanatory to what's going on. Uh, so if you could estimate the, the warmest part of the day, um, and then if you could give us an estimate of the cloud cover, is it sunny, cloudy, is it mostly sunny or partly sunny? Um, and then also uh, just generally what the wind was doing. The next section for habitat, um, pretty straightforward. So for this example here in this photo for this Forest Service uh, technician is doing the sampling in this uh, beautiful alpine uh, forb meadow. Uh, so uh, I circled these as a general habitat and landform that the sampling was done in. Uh, then for uh, the type of vegetation that you're collecting, this is really helpful for that um, vegetation association data is if you could just pick one of these. Are you mostly in a conifer forest? Are you mostly in a broadleaf forest with uh, uh, <clears throat> Cottonwoods, are you in a bunch of tall shrubs or low shrubs? Um, having that information uh, is really helpful for the associations of where we're collecting these bees from. And then if you are a professional vegetation ecologist or botanist like myself, I have high standards and I expect you to <laughs> write down the varic classification, but that of course is optional. Please take a photo uh, of your site that you are sampling at. If you could um, take photos of people netting bees and putting out the traps, it's really cool and really helpful. It's, it's really fun to share these photos. People are going to really gorgeous areas around the state and it's just uh, really fun to see where people are going. And I share these photos with these uh, updates that I do uh, with the result updates. And so maybe that should be another uh, contest, Casey, who submits the most beautiful photo. So uh, we'll maybe put that into consideration. Some of the last sections of the data form are documenting the floral resources. So we have a simple question. How many different flower species did you see in the area? And you could do one, two, over 15, just uh, circle one of those. Um, and then what we want you to do is document uh, the most common plants uh, within your area. And just do the best you can of picking the top four or five. And then if you need more room, there's more space on the back of the data sheet. You can write the common name or the scientific name. But if you can, uh, we want you to uh, document if you see a pollinator on the flowers too. So here, for example, this geranium, uh, this person saw a bumblebee on it, so just simply writing it down. Um, if you don't know what the plant is, that's totally fine. I get it. Not everyone is a botanist. So you can just write down unknown plant and take a photo of it and then uh, give me that photo with the data. And I'm really good at this. I know what all of our plants are, so I can have a pretty good idea um, in identifying and filling out that data for you. Uh, there are also other resources. This is a really awesome field guide book if you want to learn more about plants. Um, it's uh, field friendly with semi uh, water resistant pages. Uh, and then there's also iNaturalist. I, it does a really good job. I'd say it's probably like 85% accurate and close to, you know, it's like one of those AI things that might replace me in identifying plants. It does a really, really nice job in identifying plants. So if you don't know what it is, you know, you can take the photo and use iNaturalist to help uh, you figure it out. 
Uh, the last part of the data form is collecting the bowls, and there are uh, pre-printed labels here for you. So really, really important is to know, uh, notice that um, the sampling method, I have it written down, a bowl, BVT, or net, and there are three um, pieces of paper uh, labels there. So you'll cut those out, fill out the date, site name, the collector name, and please don't forget the sampling method. So you'll write down bowl or the net or the BVT. And so there are three labels there. So each of the different sampling methods will get their own sampling cup. So all of the bees that you collect from the nets are eventually going to go in their own little sampling cup, and you're going to label it with as a net. All of the bees that you collect in the bowls, uh, you're going to place those in one a separate sampling cup, and you're going to label that with bowls, likewise with the BVT. And that just really helps us keep track of which of the sampling types are more successful than others and also allowing us to document the diversity of the bees out there more effectively. So how are we collecting the bowls? So I just mentioned uh, to you with those pieces of paper, please write in pencil. Uh, and then uh, you're going to be using this sampling cup uh, that's in the middle photo here. And this is a uh, sterilized urine sample cup. And there is a, a sticker on the outside of it. So label what, on that uh, piece of paper that you stick on the inside in pencil, label it on the outside in pen or a Sharpie marker. Redundancy is key and just uh, really, really helps uh, keep track of the data much better. So collecting the bowls, you're going to collect all of the bowls into one sampling cup. You're going to pick each bowl up and dump it through a strainer, as you can see Eliza is doing in the top right hand photo. And then, so pick up the bowl, pour it out through the strainer, walk to the next uh, bee bowl, pick it up, and pour it out to the strainer. We give you a plastic spoon. You're going to scrape out the bees from the strainer or all of the insects out from the strainer into a sampling cup. And we want everything that you captured in there. Uh, Sometimes there are bees that don't look like bees. Um, there are more flies in there. That's perfectly fine. We just want everything uh, in there. And then you're going to add some preservative. And you want just enough preservative. So that photo of me in the bottom right hand of holding a preservative, you're going to want about an ounce of preservative. Here is probably a little too much, but that's uh, perfectly fine. Screw down the cap real tightly and double bag the sampling cup with the preservative. And I mentioned this before. <clears throat> Uh, anything that you collect with the net in the killing jars, those are going to go into their own separate cups. And same thing with the blue vein traps. And then you're going to uh, deliver the data to uh, me. So a quick note on this insect preservation. We highly prefer grain alcohol or ethanol, 70%. If you're here locally in Anchorage, we could give this to you. Uh, you could also use camping fuel. Uh, there's a photo of that here. Uh, kind of prefer don't using that, but if that's all you got, that that's fine. Um, we just won't have our insects uh, soaking in that too long. We'll get those out pretty quick because that could denature, or sorry, uh, could degrade some of the DNA and cause problems with their DNA barcoding. You're going to need about an ounce of this preservative for each of your sampling transects. Now, the thing is, is this Everclear, this alcohol is hazmat, and you can't take it on commercial flights. And a lot of us are uh, using commercial flights to go out to the remote areas. So we do provide propylene glycol uh, to everyone as an alternative, and it's uh, non-hazardous. It's uh, actually food grade, so you could drink it if you want, but um, please don't. Uh, and it's essentially just sugar water. Um, you can buy it uh, online really cheaply, but uh, we'll provide that for you. Um, if you need some in a pinch, you could go down to the e-cigarette uh, store and ask for their propylene glycol. It's, it's essentially the same thing. Or if you can find this antifreeze, it's this Peak Sierra antifreeze that's also acceptable too. It's, it's this pure propylene glycol. Netting bees. OK, so we talked about the traps. And let's uh, go over how to net bees. 
I would love to be in person to show you how to net bees and to do it um, effectively, uh, but I can't. We have some step-by-step -step instructions within the protocol and provide YouTube links so you can uh, watch other people doing the bee, uh, netting the bees. Um, so I really encourage you to uh, look at those videos. So to do the net sampling, you're gonna walk 20 minutes throughout the study area. So uh, wherever you choose to do the netting um, in that homogenous site, you're gonna be uh, actively walking around for 20 minutes. If you're gonna be uh, having the bowls out as well, you could uh, just stay within 100 meters from the bowls. Um, don't go further too far away. So within that 20 minutes, you could watch uh, pollinators zoom around and land on flowers. That's perfectly acceptable within your 20 minutes. If you're going to try to chase it to capture it, that's perfectly acceptable uh, for within that 20 minutes. Um, sitting in one spot and watching one flower for 20 minutes is not acceptable. We want you active up and about around walking into uh, the area so you cover more area so you have a greater chance of collecting a bee. So did you catch a bee? Awesome. Smiley face. Stop the stopwatch. And then you're going to transfer the bee to a killing jar. Here's some examples of some vials uh, that we're using. Uh, and then once you got that secured within your killing jar, you're going to resume the stopwatch and finish out your 20 minutes. Some quick tips on uh, for doing the netting. Uh, keep the net upright, as you can see in that photo uh, that I have. All insects like to fly straight up, so having uh, that cone up at the top allows the bees to fly up or crawl up to, up to the very tip of that, and then you could uh, corner them into the cone and put them into the killing jar. Um, another uh, uh, easy way to capture uh, bees and pollinators is to simply just gently place uh, the net over the entire flower and or plant, depending on the size of it, and let the bee try to uh, escape up into the cone portion. The bees are really occupied with uh, doing their foraging and probably not going to notice the net. And this is the easiest and most uh, successful way to, to capture bees than trying to swing randomly out and about in your area. This is the killing jars. Um, <clears throat> I uh, got these a little bit late, but I have been providing nets and killing jars to those who've asked. Uh, this is a really nice heavy duty plastic that is resistant to acetone. Uh, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna get some cotton balls and put in about a teaspoon of nail polish remover or acetone uh, and maybe a crumpled up paper towel within this killing jar. And then it's then quote unquote charged and it's ready to go. When you transfer bees to the killing jar, going to want to wait about 20 minutes. You, they usually die out within five minutes, but just waiting uh, till the end of your uh, sampling time frame uh, will be easiest that and more less ensured that they're dead. And everything that you collect um, off of the flowers, whether it's bee or fly, beetle, uh, we want those. So those will all go into the sampling cup as well as the uh, preservative. And don't forget to label. Now, if you're a bit squeamish and don't want to be killing uh, bees, we have an alternative that we've borrowed from the Pacific Northwest Bumblebee Atlas. And we've outlined this in the protocol and have their website. Uh, so we encourage you to do this if you're going to um, uh, or go to those websites and look at those resources if you're going to be following this method. Not too many people do it, uh, but I think it's an awesome and great way to collect uh, bumblebees and their data without having to kill them. Uh, so this is the capture and release method, and there are two uh, ways that you could go about doing it. Uh, I could provide you a vial um, that you see in the top photo there with the red cap, or a photo chamber, which is the next to the vial. Uh, you're going to uh, place the bum this, and this only works for bumblebees. For solitary bees, we can't identify them with simply taking photos. Uh, so this only works for bumblebees. So when you capture a bumblebee, uh, you'll place it into the vial, and then you're going to place that vial into an ice chest uh, for about 
uh, 10 to 15 minutes. If you don't have ice chests uh, with you, you could use a really cold running stream, which may or may not work, uh, or a snowpack. Um, and then after the bee cools down a bit, it slows down, uh, and then you're going to do a fashion photo shoot and take some really great photos of the bee. And these are some really great examples of what we want uh, to see. So place the bee out onto your data sheet or a clipboard and you could use your finger or a pen or pencil to slightly move them around. You're not going to hurt them, they're pretty resilient, uh, but you're going to pose the bee for us. And what we really want to see is the face, uh, the front of the face. We, we want to know does it have a yellow face or a black face? And we want to see the cheek. Uh, that helps us uh, uh, do the identification. We also want to see the abdomen. As you can see that third photo, we want to see very clearly what the color banding patterns are doing, whether if it's got a, a fuzzy yellow butt, fuzzy black butt, or a fuzzy uh, orange butt, or even a white butt. And lastly, we also want to see the hind legs. In that last photo there, we uh, you can see uh, what we're getting at. And <clears throat> Basically, what this allows us to do is helps us determine whether it's a typical bumblebee or if it's a cuckoo uh, bumblebee. So again, uh, please check out these resources. Uh, please check out the protocol if you want to uh, do the capture and release method. I encourage it, and um, I'm more than happy to send you more supplies if, if you need it. Sending back the data, uh, this is written in uh, standard operating procedure D on page 30. And what you're going to be doing is pouring out as much of the preservative liquid as possible. Remember, the propylene glycol is food safe and could go down the drain or on the ground perfectly fine. Uh, same thing with the ethanol, too. Uh, camping fluid, maybe not, but um, uh, use your best professional judgment. But what we want you to do is pour off as much of the liquid as possible. You can see that photo on the right. The bees are still just juicy moist um, and the sampling cup is screwed down really, really tight. And then you're going to double bag these into uh, the provided roll packs or Ziploc bags and mail it to the address within the manual. So with that, this is uh, for Casey to uh, jump in. All right, thanks, Justin. Um, so yeah, just uh putting out there the survey challenge for 2023. Same scoring system as last year. So uh, we'll we'll tally up the winner for next year too. And it's just a, a fun way to to encourage us all to get out there and and do as much bee surveying uh, as we can. Um, so yeah, that's that's it from that one, Justin. And I just want to mention quickly that a lot of the people here are already part of this, but we do have the Alaska Pollinator Coordination Group, which we, we meet three times a year. And we just stay in co close coordination and communication and all things pollinator around the state, research and monitoring, habitat management and restoration, and education and outreach. So if anybody wants to join us, our next meeting is in the fall. We just had one, I think, last week. But uh, get me your email, and I'll get you on the on the list for that that invite. It's just a good way to stay up to speed, and it's, you can come and go as you please. Um, I just put the uh, link to that group in the chat as well. And go ahead for the next one, Justin. And just a resource that uh, has been out for a year or two now, but I want to make sure everybody has access to this uh, great bumblebee guide that Jess Rick and put together. Um, really great way to practice your ID and see if when you send it into Justin, if you you got it right. So uh, check that out if you haven't seen it yet. And go ahead for the next one, Justin. That's the end of our formal training. There's our uh, contact information there. And I just put in the B tool uh, as well that I mentioned earlier, the link to that, the uh, national or actually North American wide visualization of uh, pretty much all the, the B data that they could collect. So really great resource as well there. And yeah, with that, um, we'll take your questions. I know we're a little bit over time, so obviously if people have uh, other places to be, go ahead and, uh, and uh, head that direction. But otherwise, uh, you can unmute uh, or type if you have any questions.
Um, for the naming scheme, if you have multiple people collecting, do you want multiple people's initials in the name? No, keep it simple. Whoever the uh, field leader is out there. Okay. Oh, Justin, we had a question in the chat here too. Do you recommend using insect tweezers coated in PVC to aid in your surveys in conjunction with the netting? I don't, I'm not familiar with that. I suspect that's maybe capturing bees with tweezers off of flowers. I'm, um, I'm not familiar. Uh, with that, uh, the net works just fine. It's a really big uh, 16 inch uh, hole that captures bees and other insects really, really easily. Um, but if you want to use that, um, then by all means, go ahead. All right, that was from Alexander. He says, uh, for those people wanting to avoid killing them, holding them with tweezers while photographing them. Oh, I see what that is getting at. Uh, yeah, if yeah, if you want to use uh, the tweezers, uh, that's perfectly fine. The key and the most essential thing is having a good solid contrasting background. So having the bumblebee like on the data form, that white background is really nice. And uh, yeah, I don't like the less that I could carry out to the field, the better. Uh, if you want to use tweezers, that that's fine too, but just have them uh, have have a nice, good contrasting background. Other questions, comments? Well, I just put one more link in the chat. It's our Arctic pollinator summary from the Arctic report card. So not only uh, the US or Alaska, but Arctic wide summary of our uh, bees and, and butterflies. So check that out if you're interested or work in any Arctic areas. So it, unless there's any other comments, I think we can wrap this up. Uh, any other questions or comments? Well, thank you all for your time. I uh, really am pleased to see the turnout today and uh, good luck in your field season and let us know if you have any questions. Justin, anything else from you? No, nope. uh, you can find all of our contact information at alaskabeeatlas.org and feel free to give me a call or send me an email with any question you have. I'm here to help. Excellent. All right, everyone. We'll have a great day. Thanks for your time and take care. Thank you everyone for participating this summer.